Eight years into the 20th century, something remarkable began to take shape near the picturesque Arroyo Seco in Pasadena, California. Two imaginative architects, Charles and Henry Green, were causing a revolutionary silhouette to rise from the land. What follows is a tribute in pictures and music to a most remarkable house. Its special textures, transitions, light and shadows, clouds of wood and stone. This is the Gamble House. It has been described as everything from the ultimate California bungalow to a rare and unique idiosyncratic work of art, the product of cultured minds and skillful hands, the ultimate expression of the arts and crafts movement. Biaxially symmetrical, a place of form, substance, and ever-changing light. A space of modest, vertical dimensions and compelling, close, domestic experiences. The Gamble House is all these things, and more. As perfect an example of its kind as we are fortunate enough to experience. But above all, it was a home. A place of joy and laughter tears and triumphs. A family lived here, one that trusted two men to create an environment for them in which to live out their lives, playing a major role in the community. The family, the Gambles of Cincinnati, David, Mary, and two of their three sons, it was seven years into the new century when they met with architects Charles Sumner Green and Henry Mather Green in Pasadena, California. Conversations moved swiftly from desire to reality, and a wonderful and distinctive silhouette rose from the sand and stone washed in the Arroyo Seco by a long vanished river. Old traditions represented by Victorian houses and lifestyles were being challenged, and the Greens were in the vanguard, embracing new designs that had sprung from progressive young minds and craftsmen's hands. Their client list in the beginning represented a broad cross-section of the community. Small and then larger commissions began to change the neighborhood streetscapes, which did not go unnoticed by the Gambles. They were perfect clients progressive enough to seek new directions and able to give the Greens the freedom to stretch their full talents. The Greens' ideas were not for the timid or the romantic, they were visionaries, and their visions were firmly founded in family and school. They had first come to Pasadena to briefly visit their parents, who had come here for the clear, healthy air. Unaware of the imminent building boom and receiving an unexpected commission, they set up their practice in 1893. Pasadena was moving away from its rural past as the Indiana colony, and was bustling with resort hotels frequented by the likes of the Carnegies, the Roosevelts, and the Gambles of ivory soap fame. David, Mary, and the family came from the Midwest on rolling islands of Pullman elegance. They detrained and liked what they saw. Warm, inviting sun, lush orange groves with blossoms that overwhelmed with sweet fragrances, the delicate sweep of graceful green fanned palms, creating inviting shade in which to spend lazy afternoons, foothills that turned deep purple in the early evening light, and mountains that loomed all around, close enough to touch with their dusting of snow,
beautiful to the eye without being chilling to the bone. It was a paradise, and for the newly retired David Gamble, a place he was compelled to visit again and again. But they soon tired of spending their winter months in the plush confines of the Raymond Hotel. Its destruction by fire in 1895 may have been influential in pushing them to have a home of their own in the Crown City. By 1907, the Pasadena building boom was in full swing. The ring of carpenter's hammers could be heard in every corner of the city. Pasadena was coming of age, and so were the Brothers Green. Of the two, Charles had always been more the dreamer, Henry more practical, supplying the order and discipline to their progressive designs. They both shared a passion for the fine craftsmanship that became essential to their standards and a hallmark of their style. Artists and artisans, what the Greens demanded of others, they were not unwilling to demand of themselves. This is because they were craftsmen before they became architects. In Pasadena, near the Arroyo Seco, they had a stage setting in which to frame their art. The juxtaposition of vegetation and rolling earth was made to order. It offered them an opportunity to design horizontally, to stretch out with the abundant land, to become at one with nature and invite it inside. The Greens' first encounter with Pasadena was in the stifling heat of August. The tall, skinny spires of Victorian houses offered them little respite from the high temperatures of cloudless summer skies. The green and green style that was to emerge and find itself mature in the Gamble House design would provide spaces for air to cool and move about on its own. A significant aspect of practical design in the days before mechanical air conditioning. Pulling up to the front of four Westmoreland Place, the Gamble House appears to float in a sea of green lawn. Moving closer, a driveway appears, like a desert mirage, a graceful ribbon rolling out to welcome both hooves and treaded tires in equal measure, its bricks laid out in a long chevron. The patterns converge in an almost metaphysical meet near the garage. There, great iron-bound doors opened and closed to admit their charges, gleaming polished things of chrome, steel, and rubber, peons to the horseless carriage, but at the same time sternly containing their sound and fury until they were needed for an errand or a family outing. With the feel of pressed brick underfoot, stairs were climbed. At the threshold, there was an immediate sense of having arrived at a very special place. Stained leaded glass on triptych panels reflected the promise of what waited inside. Graphic evidence of the simple beauty of all outdoors captured and brought inside. All this was the genius of Charles Green, forged of art glass and leaded in the Los Angeles studios of craftsman Emil Lang. Lit from behind, the glass, with shapes outlined in lead, is somehow given the fragility of living things. This was the power of Charles Green, inspired by the work of Lewis Comfort Tiffany. And the rose and the crane. Reoccurring throughout, symbols taken from the Gamble family crest and scattered about as reminders of a proud heritage. 
but constructed in subtle combination with oriental motifs, the symbols also stood for the family's future. Another crane also flies inside, a favorite sculpture of Mary Gamble, inside the confines of a free-form cage made up of warm woods carefully set in interlocking geometry. High art in precision joinery, forming stairs, banister, and ceiling, all in one flowing statement. With rounded corners, teak pegs cover the raw ugliness of nail holes and screw tops, overlapping joinery with ends softened and rubbed to perfection. If this woodwork failed to please the practiced eye of Charles or Henry, it would be replaced. Nothing seems to have escaped their scrutiny of perfection. It remains a solid tribute to artistry and tradition, unfettered by considerations of cost or compromise, and deserving of preservation for generations to come. But it could have turned out differently. It was in this spot that perhaps the most profound decision regarding the future of the Gamble House was made. It was after the end of World War II, and the house was occupied by David and Mary's eldest son, Cecil, and his wife, Louise. The house had become so familiar as a family home that it was impossible for them to step back and see it as the architectural masterpiece that it was. So the family entertained ideas of selling the house because it did not appear to suit the current needs of the family. But then Louise Gamble heard a prospective buyer talking about the interior hand-rubbed natural woods being too dark and wanting to paint them white. Louise promptly turned to Cecil and declared that the house was most definitely not for sale. It was a moment of epiphany for Louise Gamble. White pigment sloshed over such artistry was unthinkable. Imagine, if you will, a shroud of color brushed over carefully carved cloud lifts, blotting out masterworks of joinery, eradicating forever the delicate wisps of wood so carefully arranged by Charles and Henry in their trademark series of threes. Artistry dismissed cavalierly and cruelly by strokes of bristle and pigment, indiscriminately covering over textures of scarf joints and iron straps, not likely, and thanks to Louise, not ever. From that time on, Cecil and Louise Gamble were aware of the special treasures placed in their trust, treasures that had to be preserved and passed on so that others in time could marvel and enjoy. If the entry hall was a welcoming kiss, the living room is a warm embrace. It is space filled with many choices. An ingle nook with its cozy proximity to firelight, inviting a curling up with a good reed and a cup of warm tea. a piano designed with harmonies of wood in mind, as well as those sounded with felt against string, all a subtle seduction for the musically inclined. Deeper inside, furniture carefully designed by the Greens appealed to those seeking a vista of the Arroyo Garden 
or the groves and hills just beyond. If electric lights were a novelty just after the turn of the century, so was the notion of placing its lamps indirectly, hanging baskets of illumination, framed in delicate woods and suspended by straps of animal hide. But what of the unknown properties of these mysterious rays? It was thought that harm might come to the unshielded eye, so once again the genius of Tiffany to the rescue, in the shape of the gentle butterfly, nature's form protecting against man's manufacture. Time spent here was taken up by sights too numerous to absorb in a single visit. Ruby tiles, side by side, inlaid with a serpentine vine of flowers formed by opaque colored glasses. Complements to abstract trees placed flat against the floor on a rug fashioned by the greens, recalling admired designs by their peers, Mackintosh, Hoffman, and Klimt. Redwood panels near the ceiling would never fail to conjure up another image of the faraway Orient with clouds, trees, and birds from one culture, combining in endless harmony with yet another way of life. Everywhere, originals and variations on a theme. Dutiful attention to things from the outside brought into familiar focus inside. Delicate structures perfected by nature and plucked from their habitats by the vision of the artist and the craftsman. Roses that change color with the hours, leaves turning the season in the space of a day. Shapes welcoming the sharing of good food, a melding of sight and scent truly memorable. Everywhere shapes in concurrence, followed by shapes in a symmetry all echoing the comfort of things familiar. Doors that admit people and light in proper combination. Charles and Henry Green had attended the Columbian Exposition in Chicago on their way west in 1893. The Japanese pavilion made a particularly lasting impression. They were smitten by the simplicity of structure and sculptural forms they observed and allowed these to become a recurring theme in everything from heavy support beams to delicate ornamentation. The kitchen reflects a combination of practical aesthetics and spacious functionality. Over the years, changes were made here in the name of modernity. Most of these have been restored to the original appearance. The work table in the center has drawers that open from both sides. And the thick glass doors in the pantry still slide smoothly back and forth, their wax skids functioning as well as contemporary ball-bearing tracks. Work here made easier by the imagination and design of the greens.
Moving past the splashes of color in the form of oriental rugs and up the staircase to the second floor, hands glide over wood that feels like satin. The zigzag railings, first sanded to glass smoothness by craftsmen's hands, then sealed with a coat of shellac, and finally rubbed with oil by these same practiced hands. Work done with such care and precision, it never needed to be done again. Visible from the stairs, a pair of stained glass windows, opening not to the outside, but to the master bedroom. The Greens remembered well the lessons of their doctor father about the importance of good ventilation and light to the health of the house's inhabitants. These windows reflect those teachings and admit light and air through the interior spaces. The furnishings in the master bedroom, like most of those throughout the house, are specifically designed by the architects. Charles and Henry Green were unique in that particular ability. Their total concept also featured the design of lighting and fireplace fixtures, including those in Aunt Julia's bedroom. She was Mary Gamble's maiden sister who lived with the family. After Mary died in 1929, Julia was the only permanent resident of the house until her own death in 1945. Some believe she still lives here, a ghostly presence seen and felt by more than one visitor to the Gamble house. She would still feel at home here. Her room is as she left it in life. Warm wicker designed by the greens and soft muted colors. The wall ready for the Franklin stove she insisted on but never installed. Such was Aunt Julia's distrust of gravity heat and the Southern California climate. She was and perhaps still is a force to be reckoned with. The two youngest of David and Mary Gamble's three sons lived with them, and this was their bedroom. In the winter, the cozy brick fireplace provided necessary warmth, but for much of the year, the boys took advantage of the warm temperatures to sleep outdoors on the porch adjacent to their bedroom. The greens incorporated vast overhangs of roof line to shelter and shade. In the evening, these wonderful sleeping porches became profound antidotes to fitful nights spent in search of cool rest. The third floor is a space dominated by one room. Originally designed as a billiard room, ironically for a family that didn't play the game. The view from its windows is spectacular. A 360 degree vista encompassing the Arroyo Seco, the San Gabriel Mountains, and even City Hall and downtown Pasadena. The light coming down the third floor stairwell is captured by one of the most beautiful stained glass windows ever conceived by Charles and Henry Green.
Throughout, there are little symphonies composed to themes of inside-out, outside-in, of transitions and interfaces between disparate yet conjugal materials, gunite and grass blended by the gossamer web of an itinerant spider, clinker brick and natural stone forced to live together by the good graces of a mortar that binds. The joy of discovery in the gamble house is that one thing often leads to quite another. It is this mystical chain of surprises that results in unplanned journeys to unexpected destinations, of places where the soul and the mind can separate for a while, each to find their own pleasures from images of time and space, freshly encountered and newly experienced. The eye of the finder influenced by the eye of the creator. And once there, into the dimension of the rare and unfamiliar, where mere stones become magic transport to gardens beyond imagination and of vistas unlimited, where all sights coexist in simultaneous realms wondrous yet commonplace. All this is here and possible because a very special architectural masterpiece was placed in the joint conservancy and care of a major private university, USC, and a special city, Pasadena. They both play an important role in preserving the heritage that is the Gamble House. The University of Southern California took on a significant responsibility in terms of preservation, going beyond its traditional role, acting positively even though no precedent existed for this undertaking in this area. The dream and the reality that is the Gamble House is shared by those who bring their love and energy to the common cause. The director, the docent council, and the friends of the Gamble House all have worked hard to preserve the legacy since the heirs of Cecil and Louise Gamble donated the property. In 1966, the heirs made a joint agreement with the city of Pasadena and the University of Southern California to preserve the Gamble House for all time. As we move to the turning of a new century, much has changed, but our ties to the past remain and continue to be vital in our hope for the future.